Good afternoon. This is the Senate Judiciary and Public Safety Committee. And for the record, this is Tuesday, February 18th, 2020. Our agenda today is going to start with Senate File 1098, uh, Senator Rosen's bill on Prescription Drug Price Transparency Act. This is a re-referral from a previous committee. And I would like to have Senator Rosen, before you explain your bill, you have a A17 delete everything amendment. I do, Mr. Chair, thank you very much. So you'll have to explain your amendment a little bit and then uh, we'll consider it for adoption. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I do have uh, Stephanie Stern here with the MS Society and Dan Anderson here with the um, the health plants. But the A17 is a basic, basically a reworking of this bill, the 1098, that passed through um, committees last year and, and was in Senator Benson's omnibus bill. Since then, there has been uh, much work and actually some recently to come up with the A17 amendment. And I do believe there's another amendment to A18. So there was um, some reporting requirements on the existing and new and the, um, excuse me, let me get my act together here. There's, we, what, what we did with the A17 is we uh, changed some of the thresholds for generics and we put in a 30-day notification for the commissioner if, if um, he disagrees with the manufacturer's request to withhold info on, on public disclosure. We eliminated a lot of the reporting requirements. There is, um, like political donations have been eliminated. The uh, top 25 drugs need to be reported. That's what's taken out, passed separately last year. Uh, the threshold for um, some of these drugs was raised from 40 to 100 drugs, which gets closer, $100, excuse me, which gets closer to other states. And um, that's pretty much it. We just really skinny down the bill, basically, to, to be much more appropriate and in line with the other states that are moving along with drug transparency bills. Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Ingrid, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I do have the A18 amendment. Would you like that? Uh, I guess I could ask the author. Would you like that now, or uh, I guess I would offer that amendment, the A18. The A17 Senator, amendment. The no. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. I would you like that I'm now, sorry, you haven't actually. moved the other one yet. No. I'd I, like to move that. The A17, A17 amendment. Yes. The A17 amendment is before us. Is there further discussion? Hearing none. Mr. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed? Uh, the uh, amendment is adopted. Mr. Chair. Senator Inger Britson. I also have the A18 amendment. I think uh, members have it in their packet. Uh, Senator Inger Britson moves the A18 amendment. Uh, discussion? Senator Rosen, uh, would you explain the A18 amendment? Yes, um, thank you, Mr. Chair. And this, this is an amendment that deals with, um, I don't think I've finished my, my, uh, my conversation, that this, this bill deals with the um, existing new and the <laughs> acquired, acquired drugs. Why can't I find my information here? Thank you. And that portion of the bill deals for the new drugs that makes it in line with the Medicare Part D. So right now we just have um, uh, pricing over up to $500. This would keep it in line with the Medicare Part D, which all the other states are doing. So for the brand and the generic drug. And when I go through this, Mr. Chair, it's probably gonna make a little more sense. It's very hard to explain this without, you know, just the sequence of this bill. It probably doesn't make a lot of sense at this point. Senator Rosen, I was about to ask that myself. Uh, yeah, I'm not. <clears throat> is it better for you to include the A 18 amendment into the A17 as your new bill? Yes. 
and then explain it in its entirety? Is that what you yes. would like? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I would appreciate that. The A18 was a, a, a compromise as of um, very, very recently to make sure that uh, we stay in line with what the other states are doing and that it um, alleviated some of the concerns from some of the opponents. Senator Rosen, uh, I think I'm gonna have you explain the A17 amendment that's before us. That's a delete everything, it's a new version. For those Brand in new. the audience that don't know what a delete everything is, it's a new write-up of the former bill in the form of an amendment. That's been passed. It's in the it's in the uh, uh, form that you want us to consider. We're we're not going to advance the A18 at this time. Just get us to the basic premise of the bill. Why is this bill before us? What are we really trying to do from a thirty thousand foot elevation? Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That would help me with my sequence also. So. Um, this bill is before you because we it brings much needed pricing transparency to the convoluted market for prescription drugs. And we've been working on this issue for the last two, two years and it's a very important issue. This will help make patients more informed, make more informed decisions and demand value from the pharmaceutical companies. Drug costs now represent 23 cents of every dollar spent on healthcare. That's more than inpatient hospital costs. And the latest round of price increases just happened in January of this year, and prices increased on more than 200 prescription drugs. For example, ins insulin, it, the list price of insulin has tripled, um, nearly tripled since 2002, and the average price of insulin has increased by 64% since 2014. Naloxone, which is to reverse the opioid overdoses, one manufacturer hiked the price by 600% over the last four years from $575 to $4,100 a dose. Uh, Coboxone, to treat multiple sclerosis, brought to market in 1997, listed then at that time at $10,000 annually and is now listed for over $90,000. Zavaldi is the first cure for hepatitis C and brought to the market at 84,000 per treatment. The steep increases in drug prices harm patients and impact taxpayers who help pay for public pro programs such as Medicare, Medicaid, who um, help provide the drugs to the enrollees. So this drug price transparent, transparency initiative is supported by a broad coalition of stakeholders, patient groups, the business community, provider groups, unions, and health plans. And the goal, again, is to require drug manufacturers to have accountability for the prices charged and for increases in the prices charged for prescription drugs, excuse me, through regulatory review and public disclosure of pricing information. And we are calling this the Prescription Drug Price Transparency Act. And there are three categories of, drug, of, of drugs that this will affect. I'm gonna get this right. The existing drugs, the new drugs, and then the newly acquired drugs. And the reporting for these three drugs only happen if the drug companies raise their prices over the thresholds established in this bill. And there's four other states, California, Oregon, Nevada, and Texas have some version. But I can tell you members, and Mr. Chair, that every state is working on some kind of version of this. And even Congress is working on their own version. So significant changes have been made to the bill from last year, Senator Benson's omnibus bill. And I was a chief father, but it got rolled into her bill and you know, the, those things happen. Uh, one of the changes is uh, raising the threshold for generic drugs, that was a big compromise, and removing uh, many of the reporting requirements. And of course, we're gonna need to change the effective date and the reporting dates. The, um, as I said, the, the money is appropriated already for a Department of Health. 1.6 million is sitting there. There has been another fiscal note asked uh, in response, but I feel that uh, we are asking less of, of the reporting, and it's mostly to set up the website and the reporting mechanism, and that's what the 1.6 million is. So, if I could, Mr. Chair, uh, just briefly go through the bill. Well, it's not briefly because it is, it's extensive, but it is, uh, it's geared towards these, these three level of drugs. And subdivision three is the reporting on existing dr drugs and begins October 1st, 2021. For any drug, um, the, and the threshold is for any drug over $100 for a 30-day supply, a brand drug 
uh, well, the, if the price increases for, uh, by more than 10% in a 12-month period or by more than 16% in a 24-month 24 month period, the, the reporting requirements are listed below. Generic, which we separated and, and have treated differently, if the price increases 50% or greater over the previous 12-month period, they have to go through these reporting uh, requirements. Name and price of the drug, and these are similar for all three drugs, so I'm not going to go through this listing of the reporting requirements. Um, they're all the same for all three drugs except for one area, and I'll get to that, and that was a compromise of two. The name and price of the drug and the net increase expressed by a percentage, the factors that contributed to the price increase, the name of the generic version of the prescription drug available on the market, I think that's important, introductory price of the, prescri the prescription drug when it was approved for marketing by the FDA, and the net yearly increase by calendar year in the price of the prescription drug during the previous five years. The direct cost incurred by the manufacturer that are associated with the prescription drug, um, number one, listed separately to manufacture the prescription drug to market, including advertising cost, and to distribute and the total sales revenue for, for the prescription drug to re, during the 12-month period. Um, the manufacturer's net profit attributable to the prescription drug during the previous 12 months. The total amount of financial assistance the manufacturer has provided through patient prescription assistant programs. Any agreement between the manufacturer or entity upon any delay in offering to market a generic version. The patient expiration date of the prescription drug uh, the, the brand name prescription drug, the 10 highest prices paid for this drug during the previous calendar year in any country other than the United States, and the manufacturer may submit any documentation necessary to support this information. <clears throat> the um, reporting on new drugs, and this is where we have the A18 amendment that Senator uh, Ingerbrison was talking about, and that is the Medicare Part D part. And if we could... Um, Go to that, that would be wonderful, Mr. Chair. Senator Ingebrigtsen renews the A18 amendment. Is there discussion? Hearing no discussion, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? The A18 amendment is adopted. Senator Rosen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And basically, the old language says, beginning October 1st, uh, no later than 60 days after manufacturer introduces the prescription drug sale, for sale um, in the United States that a new a brand name drug with a price that is greater than $500 for a 30-day supply, we are um, increasing that price to $670, which is in line with Medicare Part D. And that is, like I said, that is new. Uh, that is in line with, I believe, um, California um, has, has done that. And that also applies to the generic, um, increasing it to... Medicare Part D, but we also say, and is not at least 15% lower than the referenced brand brand name drug. And so, the re so that's the reason there. That was a compromise uh, by the stakeholders for um, for some of the people that were concerned about that. That we there was a difference in the reporting requirements and the, that level. And then the re uh, reporting information for new drugs is the same. And then we go to the acquired drugs, which again is the reporting threshold for, for any newly acquired drug for a price of $100 or more for a 30-day supply is uh, for a brand drug. If that price increases more than 10% in a 12-month period or by more than 16% in a 24-month period. And then we separated generic out. And it made, if the price increases 50% or greater over the previous 12 months. So the reporting information is the same until, um, no, it's pretty much the same. Thank you. It's, it's the same. The public posting is uh, an area, Mr. Chair, where this is in your dis juris jurisdiction and also the enforcement and penalties of Subdivision 8. So right now I'm um, on Subdivision 6, public posting of information. Department of Health will review information submitted by the manufacturers and post the information on a public website in an easily accessible, understandable format for consumers. Uh, 
and they will determine the format and form that is appropriate for public display. And then we go into the trade secret portion of the bill. And there is protection under Minnesota's Government Data Practices Act, as well as federal trade secret laws. The commissioner shall not post to the department's website any information that is, number one, not public data under section 13.02, subdivision 8A, or they shall not post if it is a trade secret information under section 13.37, section subdivision 1 paragraph, or they shall not post if it's a trade secret information pursuant to the federal trade secret laws, uh, the Defend Trade Secret Laws Act of 2016. The new portion of this language that was a, also a compromise to the, to the groups was uh, the manufacturer, and this is in line 5.10 to 5.16. Manufacturers are allowed to identify submitted data considered trade secret, secret and rationale in writing, but if MDH disagrees, MDH will notify the manufacturer of the decision 30 days before posting. Also, MDH will report the nature of any data withheld and the reasons for withholding the information from public disclosure. Subdivision 7 is consultation, allows the commissioner to consult with a private entity or consortium in issuing the form and format of the information reported under this section. Also allows the commissioner to consult with reps of the manufacturers to establish a standard format for reporting the information under this section. Section 8 is the enforcement and penalties. And um, if the manufacturers who fail to comply with the reporting requirements will be fined $10,000 per day. And a manufacturer may be subject to fines for failing to submit timely reports or notices that are required if they fail to re provide required information or provide inaccurate or incomplete information. And any, uh, any of these fines will be deposited into the Healthcare Access Fund. There's also in Subdivision 9 a legislative report uh, beginning 15, uh, January 15 of 2022 on the effectiveness of these goals. So as I said, the bill becomes effective August 1st of this year, but the reporting requirements for the drug companies don't become effective until October 1st, 2021. So Mr. Chair, that is the bill. And thank you for letting me hit the reset button because <laughs> I uh, got a little confused. This is my first, first time on front of the testifying table this year. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Rosen. Um, uh, members of the committee, uh, this is a complex bill. It comes from a different committee. We're a secondary jurisdiction. I'm going to have our council review the portions of this bill that are uniquely in our jurisdiction. Not everything in this bill is. Right. So, Ms. Primo, could you uh, review what our focus should be? Mr. Chair and members, if you take a look at page four, line 27, um, this is the beginning of subdivision six, which describes uh, the manner in which the commissioner may post, publicly post information submitted by the manufacturers. And also uh, that same subdivision continues on to page five and de describes some of the data provisions as well as notice to the manufacturer. And then on page five, um, line 30, subdivision eight, which um, has some enforcement and penalties language that continues on to page six. All right. Uh, we can, uh, Senator Rosen, you have some individuals at your testimony table. Uh, do you want them to speak now, or are they there for a resource to answer questions? Um, Mr. Chair, I conferred with them, both of them, and they'd like to be resource, and, and if okay. there's any questions that they can okay. answer. Well, we'll open it up for discussion. Uh, are there any questions or concerns regarding this bill? Sir Latz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a clarification. Uh, it looks to me like the mechanism for enforcing this is entirely through the commissioner. Is that correct? Yes. There's no other route? 
Senator Rosen? Mr. Chair, that's that's correct. And the commissioner, there's there's we feel confident that that's the, the appropriate way to do it. Um, the Commissioner of Commerce has jurisdiction of of data privacy issues, and um, the PUC has um, data privacy issues. So everybody has the ability to to um, to handle some of this information. But so, Senator Letts, Mr. Chairman, the uh, or I should say trade secret. Excuse me, Mr. Senator Letts. Uh, page one. Line 16 identifies commissioner as the commissioner of health. It isn't. Is it intended that other commissioners will have some form of authority to enforce this, uh, or is it just the commissioner of health that's intended to have that authority? Mr. Chair, Senator thank Rosen. you. Uh, no, it would just be the commissioner of health, Senator Latz. Senator Latz. Um, and Mr. Chairman, I guess that. It raises the additional question that Senator Rosen just brought up when she cited a couple of other commissioners that have authority over data practices uh, questions. Um, so I just want to make sure this is, from the data practices standpoint, who's going to have the authority mm -hmm. to review and enforce uh, those provisions in law. Right. Uh, Senator Latz, according to the, Senator Rosen, it appears that only one commissioner would have that sole responsibility, the Commissioner of Health. Mr. Chair. Senator Rosen, is that correct? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and Senator Lass, perhaps I didn't explain it as well as I, I could have. Um, this is, a, you know, when it comes down to um, the, just the Commissioner of Health is going to be in charge of this information. There's nobody else. I was giving examples of where there's other commissioners that handle information from the health plans, Department of Commerce, uh, the P Public Utilities Commission handles information from the energy companies, um, and we feel very strongly that the Department of Health is very secure, and this is the appropriate area to handle this information. But I would uh, uh, defer to Mr. Anderson. Well, Senator, or, uh, Senator Rosen, I may want to ask a question, and then we'll get to the test fire. Uh, does this preclude that an individual citizen would not be able to bring an action? That they would have to file something through a commissioner? Is that how we would enforce action? Mr. Chair, I will defer to Mr. Anderson. Uh, perhaps counsel, our counsel could answer that mm -hmm. question. Ms. Primo. Mr. Chair and members, the enforcement mechanisms uh, in this bill are all administrative penalties imposed by the Commissioner of Health. Mr. Anderson, would you want to first identify yourself for the record and then uh, see if you could expand on this discussion? Sure. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Dan Andres and I'm with the Minnesota Council of Health Plans. Um, the idea behind the bill was that the Department of Health would be kind of the sole entity collecting that information, looking it through it, disseminating it, putting it on a website. And because of that, they would be the ones also assessing penalties if that information did not come in. Uh, we are trying to follow what other states have done, and this is kind of the same practice that um, other states have used. Mr. Anderson, in other states, are, the, uh, are individuals allowed to file an action? Um, Mr. Chair, there are um, individuals who can request that information, and that's why we've allowed this information or this additional language in here so that Department of Health can consult with the manufacturer to make sure that trade secret data does not get um, disclosed. Um, that's always been our intent. We don't want trade secrets to be disclosed. Um, we're in that kind of the same vein when we file our rates with, with state agencies. We mark things as trade secret that we don't want out in the public. Um, so we anticipate that it's got part the same way. Mr. Chair. Senator Ralph. Uh, just a point of clarification then uh, to Senate Council. It, you're, you're saying that this does not create a private right of action that anyone could, uh, as you know, we have a private right of action statute in this state. And I'm, I'm somewhat concerned that that might somehow be uh, invoked here. And I just opinion that, that that is not going to be the case. Senator Ralph and members. Um, Council. The there is no private right of action created in this language uh, in the A-17 amendment. I think part of that is that we're focusing more on the trade secret language 
and um, trade secret data is not something usually an individual would litigate over, uh, a business would. And if it's a business, then the relationship would transfer to the commissioner that would oversee that business. Am I yes, Mr. Chair. concluding correctly? Mr. Chair, I, I believe that, that um, the, the language in the A-17 amendment does um, confirm that, right. and that is the intent of the bill. Is there further discussion? Is there less? Mr. Chairman, I guess just to clarify, so the whole purpose of the bill is for there to be information disclosed and then presumably most of that posted publicly for review by all sorts of people that have interest in, in the pricing here. Uh, so I'm just trying to contemplate if, if a, an organization that were trying to make sure that uh, prices were appropriately transparent had a concern about whether or not it was, whether or not this were complied with, they would bring that directly to the attention of Commissioner of Health, and then the Commissioner of Health would have to evaluate uh, that complaint, if you will, or concern that was raised. Is that sort of the, the mechanism that's anticipated? Sir Rosen? Yes, Mr. Chair, and uh, yes, that is the mechanism. There, there is a, there's transparency in here, and I think that's important. If there is an increase on the drug price, then there has, then, then there's transparency available to the consumer. And I, and I think that's where we want to get some accountability built into these drug pricing to the cost of care, basically. And this is one way to do it. And I, I believe uh, Ms. Stern would like to say something. Oh, sure, I can just speak to that would as Would you a, identify yourself for Sure, uh, I'm Stephanie Stern, the Associate Vice President for Policy and Advocacy with the National Multiple Sclerosis Society representing the Upper Midwest chapter. Um, and the reason why we care so greatly about this legislation is because people with MS need access to a disease-modifying therapy to ensure that their disease doesn't get worse uh, and their disability does not progress. And the MS disease-modifying therapies have been increasing exponentially over the past several years. Um, just for a really quick example, um, in 2013, the annual price of, average price of the uh, drugs was $60,000, and last year it was already $89,000. Um, and we uh, are just trying to figure out, and that, I don't want to speak for the entire advocacy community, but what we want to know is, um, what is what is happening here, and how can we use that information to craft really effective solutions to address pricing-related issues? Because right now we feel we don't even have the information to advocate for making changes to bring prices down for people with MS. Mr. Chairman, uh, and ma'am, you're satisfied with the uh, uh, compliance and enforcement mechanisms uh, yes. in the bill? Yes. That there are, um, I mean, the, the Commissioner of Health is going to be able to enact penalties for every, every day of noncompliance. So. I have a question. If, um, if, if the Commissioner had reason to or had a report from someone saying investigate uh, the pricing, uh, what would happen if the commissioner failed to investigate? Is there any uh, enforcement of the enforcer, let's say, or is that solely his judgment? Is there an appeal process for that individual to, uh, if the commissioner failed to investigate, is there some other way to go around that commissioner or does it stop solely with that commissioner? I mean, I can't speak to the, I, I speak for myself. I don't really, um, I'm not sure of the difference between it, um, an investigation and reporting. Um, I think most of this is automatically triggered reporting based on um, price increases. Um, and then the manufacturer will be required to submit a, a lot of documentation to help understand why that um, price increase went up or why the, um, this expensive drug came to market. Um, so I don't, I, don't, I would uh, defer to the two of you to th if, if there's any piece in here that you would classify as an investigation. Mr. Anderson? Uh, Mr. Chair, there's, there's nothing in the bill right now that provides like an appeal process. Um, so I might defer to counsel if there's something already in, in trade secret law that allows that, but um, we didn't go that route in this bill. Or if the corporation disagreed with an outcome of the commissioner. 
uh, is there an appeal process for the corporation? Mr. Chair, yes, there is, and that is the new language that was in the A-17 amendment on uh, 5.10 to 5.16. If a manufacturer believes information should be withheld from public disclosure pursuant to this paragraph, the manufacturer must clearly and specifically identify that information to describe the legal basis in writing when the manufacturer submits the information. If the commissioner disagrees with the manufacturer's request to withhold information from public disclosure, the commissioner shall provide the manufacturer written notice that the information will be publicly posted 30 days after the date of the notice. And that 30-day language was highly negotiated. Mr. Chair. <laughs> it was very important. And uh, Mr. Chair, I don't know if you've got this in your packet of the stakeholders, um, this piece. But it's ARP, it's uh, the MS Society, SEIU, League of Minnesota Cities, Council of Health Plans, Business Partnership, Association Minnesota Counties, Education Minnesota, Medical, Minnesota Medical Association, MNA, Minnesota Farmers Union, Clearway, Sanford, <coughs> County Health Plans, CWA, uh, Community Health Centers, AFL-CIO, Blue Cross Blue Shield, um, Hennepin Health, Health Partners, Medica, UCARE, Preferred One, uh, it just, um, it's, it's quite extensive. Also, the Association of Accessible Medicine had some um, issues and has removed opposition to the bill with the A-17 amendment. And it was mostly of the uh, generics that we worked uh, very hard to make sure that we address that issue. Senator Rell. Um, Senator Rosen, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Rosen, I, one thing I am somewhat concerned about, and that is this, in fact, I was going to ask some questions on that, about the commissioner's uh, finding, contrary to the belief of the, of the corporation, that, this is a, that it is not a trade secret. Is there anything contemplated that would allow for an administrative review of that through an administrative law judge or other procedures? Because I feel that, that, that we may have a problem here if a company feels that they, they've been wrong, that, they, that we're going to have start lawsuits that uh, will, will interfere with the whole operation of this. So I'm, I'm somewhat concerned about what happens when the commissioner, which as I read this, has the sole discretion to say yes or no. What happens then? So Ralph, I'm going to let uh, counsel try and grapple with that one. Ms. Primo. Mr. Chair and members, the information in uh, that's being collected would be government data, and government data is subject to Chapter 13 remedies and penalties, which provide for administrative uh, remedies as well as civil action, including an injunction, um, and in some cases when there is a willful violation, uh, criminal prosecution. So all those, all those remedies uh, would be available to drug manufacturers if the commissioner um, goes ahead and publishes information that manufacturers believe does classify, is classified as trade secret um, information. And that can be, uh, Mr. Chair, and, and that can be found on um, section 13.37 as referenced in the above lines of that section. Sir Ralph? Uh, I guess my, my question is sort of as a follow-up then uh, maybe to counsel that if the, uh, uh, if the commissioner does go ahead and publish before there's been any uh, possible proceedings on this, uh, well, first of all, what kind of trouble is that going to create? Obviously, the, co the company is going to now be in a position of having what they believe to be trade secrets released. And this is kind of once the cat's out of the bag, there's not a lot of, <laughs> it's pretty tough to stuff it back in if it was, in fact, a trade secret. So I'm somewhat concerned about the 30-day the time, the timeline and, and being able to determine that this is, uh, uh, quickly to determine that whether this is, in fact, a trade secret or not. Do you want to answer that one? Um, Mr. Chair and members, I, I believe the, I, I don't want to speak for the stakeholders, but I'm just guessing about how this might work in practice. You have the commissioner who disagrees with the manufacturer's assessment of the trade secret information. That commissioner has to then provide that um, notice to the manufacturer that in 30 days we plan to publish this information because we don't uh, agree with you. And in that 30 days is when 
um, the manufacturer would most likely exercise their ability to go into court and prevent disclosure. Um, hopefully that answers your question. I, I guess my question is, is that 30 days a sufficient amount of time? I mean, um, I know how things sometimes work in, the, <laughs> in this business, and uh, I'm just concerned about that length of time, that we, we, we don't want trade secrets to be released if they are, in fact, trade secrets. So I have some concern about that, and not necessarily against what's going on with this bill, but just that the general, general concern over the release of trade secrets. Sir Rosen, is the stakeholders, especially the corporations that have trade secrets, are they comparable with the 30-day? Mr. Chair, uh, thank you for that question. And Senator Ralph, there was no discussion of any other timeline except 30 days. And I do believe that there is enough d defense in the paragraphs above um, for the public data in Section 13.02 the trade secret information in, in Section 13.37 and the Federal Act of the Defend Trade Secret Act of 2016 that does provide coverage for, for that information. But uh, no, one, no one suggested that it wasn't, it wasn't 60 days or 90 days. It was always 30 days, and that's how we came to that 30-day mark. You have something? Mr. Anderson. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, the 30 days also comes from Nevada where they have a very similar law, uh, mainly just for insulin. It's being expanded to arthritis medications. So that's where that came from. So manufacturers are already having to work within that system. Sir Rosen, I have to admit that anytime I see us modeling our legislation after states like California, I get a little concerned. <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> And so um, uh, usually references to other states, I really don't put a whole lot of solace in. Uh, we have to do our own work right. and, and, try and make, try to make the solving of this issue uniquely for Minnesotans. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, and Mr. Chair, actually, thank you. It was actually, much of it was uh, modeled off, off of Oregon. And Texas, Nevada, and California have something in place. But like I said, every state is grappling with this. Hopefully, we have found a sweet spot. There is some opposition to it, and perhaps you have this in your packet. But um, some of the concerns on Senate File 1098 are based off the old bill. And, um, and the, the back page is... Um, I'm not sure if you have this in your packet yet, but Pharma um, is opposing it. But they were certainly at the table. And I appreciate their concerns, but if you read through this, it, um, I don't completely know what they're asking for, ex except they don't want this bill at all. And I, I do think we have an opportunity to set the benchmark for a model uh, bill for all the states. And like I said, Congress is grappling with this too. Uh, is there anyone from Pharma that wishes to speak for or against this bill? Anyone else in the audience who wishes to speak for or against the bill? Seeing none, Senator Lapps. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, one, I think 30 days probably is adequate to get a temporary restraining order, at least if the, if the findings can be established uh, for a court to at least put a hold on it until they've had a chance to review and all the parties can submit uh, you know, documentation. Um, secondly, I would like to know what states the chair would find persuasive uh, for future reference, Mr. Chairman. Uh, That's a trade secret, is, Senator. Uh, uh, Texas, perhaps? Uh, is there any other discussion before us? Uh, Senator Rosen, I, I, before we uh, consider final action, I noticed that in other areas of the bill you have uh, specific dollar amounts uh, referring to the cost of certain uh, drugs and I'm always nervous about recognizing a specific dollar amount because dollar values change from year to year and um, uh, just the price of a dollar doesn't have the same buying power from year to year and that means the legislature will be doomed to consider this bill many times in the future, because $500 that's referenced in one page will be different. I know we changed that in the A18, but is there any other references to specific dollar amounts? 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, there is in uh, 2.9 uh, yeah, for the drug for which the price was $100 or greater for a 30-day supply. That actually in the last year's bill was $40. We did increase it to $100. I was price is going up. As price is going up. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's exactly right. And I believe that was modeled um, off, of, off of other um, states, too. I kind of hate to say that, but it's true. And uh, we did change it in the new drug pricing from 500 to the Medicare Part D, 670. And then in the acquired, um, there is the same thing as um, on 4.4. It was changed from $40 to $100 or greater for a 30-day supply. So we did uh, listen to, to some concerns. I'll be honest, Mr. Chair, there's... there's um, you know, uh, uh, um, there are some people that don't care for this bill, but I do think if we are here to do the do the right thing for our consumers out there and to get a handle on this, we're just asking for some accountability, some notification. If you are going to increase the price, tell us why. I don't think that's an unreasonable request, and I believe the consumers and the the consumers deserve that. And we, we need to know that in order to get a handle on this cost of health care. Other questions, Senator Anderson? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Senator Rosen, you mentioned that other states as well as Congress is ra grappling with this idea. Is there any state that has basically come to completion and has actually have it in play and working on it? If you could give us an idea. Mr. Chair, um, and thank you, Senator Anderson, for the committee, or the question. Um, Oregon, this was craft a lot uh, from Oregon, and as I said, Nevada, California, and Texas. Texas is a little, it's got uh, more in it. There, everybody's got a little bit different version, um, but but you look at the stakeholders and who have been who have been working on this, it's, it's pretty impressive. So I... I do put a lot of credence into that. It's a wide group of people that have had their hands in this. And it's, um, as I said, we've been working on this for over a year. Mr. Anderson. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Anderson, um, Oregon has started to collect information, started to put out reports. Nevada's very close as well. I think they just did their initial one. The Texas bill just passed last session of the floor amendment, and they're going through rulemaking. So some of these states are a little bit further ahead than others, but... Oregon is probably the one that's furthest out, uh, along with Nevada. Any other questions? Well, is there anyone else in the audience who wishes to speak on this bill? Hearing none, Sir Ralph. Sir Mel <laughs> Ralph, would you move the bill? Uh, Sir Ralph moves Senate file. 1098 as amended be recommended to pass and be sent to the Finance Committee. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion prevails. Thank you, Senator Rosen. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Now Thank move you on members. to Senate File 3074. Senator Limmer, uh, you have Senate File 3074. My understanding is you have an author's amendment. Uh, I do, Mr. Chair. Um, and I don't believe I have that with me right now, so you'll have to tell me what amendment that is. Uh, I believe that's the A4 amendment. Uh, Mr. Chair, that's a technical author's amendment, but I'll allow counsel to explain it. 
Okay. Council? Mr. Chair and members, um, yes, the A4 amendment is a technical amendment. Um, it, you know, corrects some grammatical errors, um, and it inserts uh, d divisions into the reporting requirement to the legislature because the House um, committees also have divisions now. And um, it, deletes, it deletes some superfluous language as well on line um, 5.7. This is an author's amendment, members. Um, so we will uh, vote on the A4 amendment. All in favor say aye. 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 Oh, I'm sorry, I thought Senator Limmer moved it. Senator Limmer moved the A4 amendment. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. The amendment is moved. Back to uh, the file 3074, Senator Limmer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senate File 3074 is a bill that addresses the use and regulation of unmanned aerial vehicles, UAVs, which are commonly known as drones. And we're specifically focusing on the use by law enforcement agencies. Now, many years we've been talking about drones and the use of them. They seem to be becoming more and more popular, not only by civilian use, but uniquely by law enforcement and entities. And Senator Dibble and I have kind of tag team back and forth over the years uh, trying to get regulation on, on uh, the use of dr law enforcement drones. Uh, this year, the Data Practice uh, Commission, or the subcommittee under the LCC, during our interim, took a deep dive into the use of law enforcement drones. And uh, we, we uh, gathered a collection of uh, stakeholders, law enforcement individuals. The ACLU was involved in the group called MinKoji, a citizens group uh, focused on data privacy. Uh, got together over numerous meetings and uh, I think we have a bill that everyone kind of agrees with. Um, last year, um, we were close to a final agreement, but there were a couple sticking points, so we decided it was better to err on the side of caution, and so we paused. And uh, I think during this interim, I think we came up with a better bill. Uh, with the stakeholders' buy-in, uh, we have what we have as an agreement, and that's in the form of Senate File 3074. Uh, uh, as it passed the Data Practices Subcommittee, it, it passed with a unanimous vote in that bipartisan team of legislators. The ACLU supports passing drone legislation so that we have a legislative framework that law enforcement that law enforcement may use to know what we expect of them with the use of this new technology. And law enforcement will continue to be able to do their, jo their jobs with drone technology, and we are not changing the concept of the open fields doctrine that they rely on for uh, gathering uh, site-only evidence. Uh, I'm gonna ask counsel to describe the merits of the bill Council? You look surprised. I can do that too. Mr. Chair and members, um, I'll walk through the bill, um, uh, but there is a more detailed summary in your packets if, if needed. So section one is a new section, and this authorizes a law enforcement agency to make otherwise private or non-public UAV data accessible um, for um, public safety reasons. Uh, there are some other forms of data like body cam data which are also subject to that same provision. Section two is a, a cross-reference that's being inserted into chapter 13. Section three is the main substantive portion of this bill and much of the language is the same as the committee saw last year. However, we've now added a definition for um, terrorist attack at line 2.9. I believe we've also added a definition for government entity at line 2.4. Section, 
uh, subdivision two is the same as last year. It's the general prohibition on using a UAV unless a warrant is, off, is uh, obtained. Subdivision three, which provides for certain uses um, that uh, are exceptions to the warrant requirement. Here, there are several new provisions, um, including um, a uh, line 2.25 to collect information from a public area if there is a reasonable suspicion of criminal activity. And um, 2.29 over a public area for officer training or public relations purposes. And on page three, line 3.1, uh, I believe is also new language that authorizes a government entity to make a request to the law enforcement agency so that um, the law enforcement agency may collect some data for the benefit of that government entity, for example, a Parks and Rec Board. And much of the rest of the bill is uh, language that the committee saw last year. If there are any specific questions, I'm happy to answer them as well. Senator sure. Dimble showed up. Mr. Chair. Um, Yes, yeah, Senator Ingebretson. Thank you. I do have a question um, with regards to the 3.3 uh, uh, for a uh, entity requesting in writing to the law enforcement agency and specifies the reason for request and proposed period of use. Maybe Senator Limmer, you can talk about the discussions you had over that, or or uh, uh, I'm, I'm I'm thinking specifically uh, land and resource. Uh, management or uh, even even the tax assessor uh, trying to gain access to properties that might be yeah, uh, built on properties where they have no access, things like that. Is that what, is that what was discussed well, at all? Senator, Senator Limmer. Uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Ingerbritson, if I can draw your attention to the summary on the bill and on the back page, page two, uh, at the top of the page, it says subdivision three authorized uses. There's gonna be some cities that a police department will have a drone, but that drone could be used by other uh, divisions of a local government. Um, and the exceptions that don't, do not require a warrant is listed in those bullet points. Some of those are during an aftermath of an emergency situation that involves the risk of death or bodily harm, uh, a public event where there might be heightened risk of safety, uh, counter the risk of a terrorist attack, especially something that's quickly known by a law enforcement agency, but uh, they need to get a drone up in the air. And they're not looking for anything specific. They're just needing to assess whether the threat is real or not. Uh, to prevent the loss of life and property in a natural or man-made disaster. Collect information over a public area if there's reasonable suspicion of broad criminal activity. Uh, crash reconstruction purposes. The aftermath of an accident, sometimes it's best to get an aerial view so you can get a proper perspective of what really happened. Um, we even had discussed perhaps the search for a small child that became lost um, and might be out in a marsh or uh, uh, an open field, and it's hard to look horizontally across that field, but if something's up in the air, uh, we wouldn't think that we would want to burden the system to seek a warrant for that purpose. We'd want to get up and uh, being time would be of essence. Uh, so those are the activities that we were thinking of. Just a follow, quick follow-up. Thank you, uh, Senator. So, so when you're talking about a government entity, it would be law enforcement only, or if you're talking about a small community, would, would somebody uh, within that community, other government agency other than law enforcement, you could be able to utilize it, not using law enforcement to utilize it for them is what I'm, what I'm wondering. Senator Dibble, welcome. Thanks, thank you. Yeah, I think that's the point of that provision is to allow like a parks department or someone like that to, to use the drone for surveying their property, drawing survey lines, or maybe they wanna put in a new parking lot or something like they need to get a nice aerial view of their property for that purpose. It's, 
intended to indicate that that's not a big deal, um, that other agencies, other departments of the city sure. or whomever can borrow the drone or you know, ask the cops to come over and, and uh, fly the drone over and take some pictures. The only requirement of that section is that that request be made in writing, which is also not intended to be onerous or burdensome, just a quick email, hey, Bob, you know, can we borrow the drone this afternoon and take a few pictures? Sure. Um, that's, that's all that that speaks to. So, so Mr. Chair, so Mr. Chair, I guess I'm just not real clear in my question, but you wouldn't have, the, the law enforcement agency wouldn't be going and doing that boundary line thing. It would be the entity that wants to utilize it. Problem I would have with that is if law enforcement is utilizing and all of a sudden, oh boy, we see something there and we were after boundary lines only, I'm sure you had that discussion. Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator Ingerbritson, we did have a lot of discussion about uh, the whole concept of, um, what did I call it, open fields doctrine. That's where uh, law enforcement can look across someone's property and if they see evidence of some wrongdoing, they can use that uh, in a courtroom to enact a criminal charge. That also applies to drones. Uh, a drone can get up so high and look over a fence or a tree line and they can see something also that you couldn't see from, let's say, a public access trail or a road. That too can be used for evidence. It's when you use a drone to go up to the window of a fourth floor apartment and look inside the window, that's when, it be, that's when law enforcement would cross a line that it would need a warrant to have that type of, of uh, observation deck. Uh, used specifically against an individual uh, for a specific search. Thank you. Senator Limmer, I wonder before we go to more questions with uh, members, if we could get the testimony from uh, those that are here. So uh, Julie uh, Decker, I wonder if you want to start first. And again, introduce yourself first, please. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, my name is Julia Decker. I'm the policy director for the ACLU of Minnesota. Um, as Chair Lerman noted, this bill before you is the result of a number of years of work and negotiation between us and law enforcement stakeholders, holders, including over the interim. Um, as some of you may recall, the ACLU started out in a quite a different position on this issue with more stringent requirements for law enforcement and fewer exceptions from getting a warrant. Now, law enforcement have testified in past hearings uh, about the many powerful public safety uses of drones. And through numerous discussions around this issue, we've agreed to compromise to include some of those uses as additional exceptions to the warrant requirement. Nevertheless, it is essential to have guidelines and guardrails for drone use by law enforcement. And Senate File 3074 imposes much needed limits where there currently are none. Uh, right now, there is no state law regulating law enforcement use of drones, whether it's for locating a missing child or secretly surveilling someone who's just going about their everyday life. As Chair Limmer noted, uh, it just takes one Google search these days to see how rapidly drone use by law enforcement agencies is proliferating. Uh, so this bill fills a gaping void in the state law, in the current state law. Um, the ACLU of Minnesota supports this bill while remaining wary of and watchful over the proliferation of new and ever more powerful technologies that present additional threats to privacy rights and civil liberties. And I'm sorry, I'm not sure what's going on with the mic. It sounded good to me. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we also have a testifier, uh, Case Wayland. If he would like to come up. Welcome. Again, introduce yourself and continue with your testimony. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Cass Wayland. I am a member of the Minnesota chapter of Restore the Fourth. We are a pro-Fourth Amendment anti-surveillance organization. Um, we also support the bill uh, and echo some of the concerns raised by the ACLU. Um, the biggest thing that I'd like to point out or the biggest request I'd like to make is that um, it would be great if uh, one of the things I like most about the bill is that it has a provision under restrictions that requires the governing agency to 
approve the purchases or the acquisitions of these drones. And so if law enforcement wants to get drones, they have to go in front of their governing, their governing body and say, hey, can we buy this? And they have to get approval for it. Um, what we'd like to see is if there was some requirement for soliciting public input before acquiring that um, approval. So if um, the BCA wanted to get drones that the, the I'm not quite sure with the commissioner who's who oversee the BCA, but the commissioner just wouldn't be able to say hello, yes, yeah, sure, go for it. They would have to be solicit public uh, solicit public input before just giving them that approval. Um, that would I feel like that would really strengthen the uh, the intent behind that provision, which is to get you know get some oversight into the use of the of drones. Okay, thank you. Sure, uh, Senator Ralph. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, um, Mr. Weiland, you raised an issue that I was going to raise uh, not quite in the same fashion, but uh, Senator Limmer, with regard to the public use uh, the, for non-law enforcement, uh, the, the way the bill is written, which I think is fine, that there be a request to the law enforcement agency. So then I presume it's the law enforcement agency that number one would decide yes or no. In other words, they would have the power to say, well, we don't think this is an appropriate use. And secondly, who would actually operate the drone? Would that be the law enforcement agency helping out the, uh, the, 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 the non-law enforcement group, or would there be a, a third party who might not have the same sensitivities as to where they can go with the drone and the kind of things that they can employ it for? Chairman Limmer. Mr. Chairman, uh, to that last uh, reference of who would fly the drone, uh, we really didn't get into that discussion much, uh, and and we should have. Um, it'll be something that we'll have to continue to work on, but uh, I would imagine you wouldn't want to have a novice fly an expensive drone for a non-law enforcement purpose. I think that the primary use of a drone would be for law enforcement purposes. Any other uh, responsibility by another division of government uh, would have to be secondary. It's kind of like uh, you wouldn't want your your uh, recreational commissioner to be uh, or a or a director of a political subdivision to have the use of a drone when it's being used when it needs to be used for an emergency purpose. So it uh, it really came to us as part of a discussion by others that work in. Uh, political subdivisions wanting to use a drone that perhaps a law enforcement agency has within the confines of their government, uh, city council or county government, that if uh, they could use it, they could. Uh, I would think there would have to be in the written policies that we are requesting in this bill that there that would be addressed who would fly that drone and that person would have to be adequately trained for it as well. Uh, we're leaving that up to the written policy uh, making uh, per governing uh, subdivision. Senator Lerner, I'd like to ask our counsel if she can respond to one of those questions. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, this bill solely regulates law enforcement use of um, a drone. It, it doesn't create any regulations for how another government entity may use a drone except for this very specific situation where the government entity would like to um, make a request of law enforcement. And yes, Senator Limmer, I, I believe you just stated that the law enforcement agency does retain some discretion and um, specifically in subdivision nine, when they craft their written policies, there is um, a phrase in there that asks them to also craft that policy with this specific use uh, in mind, uh, line 4.12, including requests for use from government entities. So they get to sort of dictate um, along the guidelines that are provided in this bill um, how and when and who um, operates this UAV. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Senator Lance. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, first, I think I'd like to ask uh, retired Senator Tennyson if he was aware that uh, the Tennyson warning is being explicitly accepted or exempted from the provisions in this bill. And, and what does he have to say about that? I see he's sitting in the audience. Oh, he's waving I, us I off. I think he's very happy. <laughs> I object, Mr. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Chairman, yes, um, on a more Lim serious uh, note, Lance. Um, I, I'd like to know if the courts were involved in the formulation mm -hmm. of this bill. There are a lot of provisions in here directing judges to do certain things um, with regard to filing orders, uh, warrants, serving warrants, uh, uh, submitting inventories and notices to individual subjects of warrants, uh, reporting data mm -hmm. on their issuance or denial of warrants uh, to at least the court administrator, and then the court administrator is being required to submit aggregate data of the same uh, to a number of places. So we're, we're, was the courts involved in fashioning these provisions so we know that we're not creating a, like a whole new mess for them to have to comply with, specifically individual judges as well who might not ordinarily be doing these kind of things with regard to what their work or product is? If we could ask our counsel again. Mr. Chair and members, um, I don't specifically know whether the courts were consulted. I, I wasn't involved in all stakeholder meetings. However, the language in this bill that um, requires courts and prosecutors, um, I think, so, uh, to do anything, subdivision 10, um, that was taken verbatim, but for the specific um, provisions about UAVs uh, from our wiretap warrant statute. Um, so the process uh, falls in line with that specific statute. No additional requirements are, are being created um, except for this is a new, new uh, type of uh, a new warrant requirement generally. Sarah Latz? So, I'm sorry, uh, uh, counsel, you're saying the subdivision 10 language was basically pulled out of the wiretap? Okay. Um, yeah, that's helpful to know. So that at least they won't have to be uh, inventing a whole new process. Yeah. Um, and so I think that would be helpful. And, and I mean, I would assume well, we don't know what the quantity or volume of these warrants will be, how much of a burden it ends up placing on the judicial system, although I think it's appropriate. Uh, I, I like all the information that's being gathered and conveyed. Um, I did have a question about uh, the provisions starting at line 4.1, uh, the deletion of the collected data. Um, it provides... Um, seven-day deadline for deleting the data unless the data is part of an active criminal investigation. I would assume there was some robust discussion about what other uses the collected data might be put to. Um, and I'm, I'm, I guess I'd like to know a little bit more about those discussions and uh, whether or not there is any kind of a bypass mechanism in the event that there is some non-active criminal investigative data uh, that the parties that collected the data think would be valuable to keep within the law enforcement agency for some reason, is there some other process to enable that data to be uh, saved? Because I, I don't see it in the bill. Maybe I'm just missing it. And maybe the parties have had this conversation and decided they don't want to allow any other data to be saved for any other conceivable purpose and don't want to allow, for example, a judicial bypass mechanism. Senator Dibble, we're talking about uh, point, uh, 4.1, if you're looking on the bill. Would either one of you like to speak to that? Well, Mr. Chairman, um, Senator Limmer. I'm trying to recall the conversations that we've had. We had numerous discussions over the summer and fall uh, as members of the um, data practice uh, subcommittee. Uh, we had discussions with Drew Evans, the superintendent of BCA. Uh, we had uh, requests from the ACLU as well as Minkoji, uh, trying to limit any unnecessary information from being kept 
in any type of log that didn't have any specific purpose to criminal uh, activity or investigative use. Um, when it came to any other type of information that might be collected by a different governing purpose, I don't believe we had a lot of discussion about it. I think our focus was more on law enforcement and what would be the appropriate uh, retainage number of days on information that would not necessarily um, be important to a criminal investigation. I don't know if anyone else who has given testimony up here before retains any uh, memory of anything else. I think I'm covering it pretty pretty much the way it happened. Um, I don't think there was much discussion beyond the law enforcement purpose. Senator Lyons. Uh, thank you for that, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, active criminal investigation is a pretty focused uh, categorization, and um, you know, although it doesn't take much, I guess, for an agency to decide they're going to open up an investigation. But I, um, and I, I think the way I read the bill, once the data is transmitted outside of the law enforcement agency to some other proper uh, requester, like a governmental entity. Um, uh, then it's not subject to that deletion requirement. It's only the agency, the law enforcement agency that would have to delete their underlying data. If I'm reading it correctly, I, I see counsel's nodding her head yes. Um, but you know, I can imagine a scenario where law enforcement reviews some data and they see some suspicious information in there something they'd maybe like to keep an eye on because it raises some questions in their mind. Um, and, and we're getting into some difficult territory here, I understand. Um, but uh, especially you get trained investigators, they can start to recognize patterns. Um, and even though they don't necessarily have enough information yet to open an active criminal investigation, uh, maybe there's some value to hanging on to the data for a little while to see if there's any uh, follow-up patterns that become evident or if they're anticipating that there is an event that's going to happen in two or three weeks that might be similar in nature that might give them some reason to be suspicious. They think something's going to happen here. It doesn't happen here, but if it happens in two or three weeks and we've got the uh, data gathered from that event, it'd be helpful to be able to compare it back to the earlier event and see if there's a pattern there. Um, I, I worry, like I think everyone in this room, about gathering data and just holding on to it to look for patterns forever. Um, we had the same conversations uh, with regard to license plate reader data uh, quite a few years ago. Um, but uh, I'm just wondering if there's any conversation about that, uh, whether there's some other mechanism for hanging on to data, uh, or maybe suggesting there should be some other mechanism for allowing data to be retained for longer than seven days if there is some reasonable basis for doing so. Mr. Chairman. Senator Limmer. Mr. Chairman, Senator Latz, uh, we did have discussion about that primarily with law enforcement, uh, specifically uh, Drew Evans, superintendent of BCA. Uh, after that discussion uh, and coming to this particular seven-day standard, um, I remember that everyone was in agreement with that statement and that conclusion. I, uh, I, I know there was concern about holding on to information that was not specifically uh, defined as a suspicious activity. We didn't have that discussion. Uh, we just talked about uh, information that might be considered unnecessary and that there is no purpose to hold it beyond seven days. Uh, in the end, uh, what you have in front of you is an agreement uh, or a conclusion made by all of the participants that were involved in this discussion, um, and that's the seven days. Uh, if, if there was or would have been more concern to hold that information, that would have been the time to bring it up. But uh, it didn't go beyond the seven days. Senator Latz, I wonder if we could have uh, re uh, research here. Uh, talk about where the data goes. Um, Council. Mr. Chair and members, I think um, just to reiterate something, maybe uh, 
Senator Latt said that um, this bill does not regulate um, data that is sent over to the government entity, so that would be subject to their regular retention pro po policies as well as um, current provisions governing that type of data, which would mo most likely actually make that data public once it's with the government entity. Senator Latz. So I, I wonder if there's anyone, um, you know, and maybe I'm just thinking too far out of the box here, um, but I guess I'd be more comfortable if there were some mechanism by which upon some kind of a level of showing uh, in an application to a court that a court could authorize data to be retained for 30 days, for example, or for 60 days. Um, if, if uh, for example, a law enforcement reviewing the data thought, well, there may be something more here, but we don't have enough to start an open criminal investigation, but we think it's a precursor to information that we expect might come from an event that's already planned for 20 days from now. Um, and if a judge could review it and say, well, there's, there's enough of a showing made here to hang on to the data and to keep it under the protected classification for another 30 days um, that a judge could approve it on a limited basis. Uh, so, I mean, was this... Senator Latz, I, I wonder... I don't, I'm not drafting on, you know, off the top of my head here, but I'm thinking about a provision that might be appropriate. Yeah. I wonder if uh, Ms. Decker would come up and give us her opinion on that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so my recollection is that there was discussions about the data retention limits and that we did reach this agreement, this balance between the parties. Um, I think that's what we do, right? We draw lines and uh, we came to this agreement. Um, so I think that's where we are. That's where this bill is. Um, so. Okay. Thank you. Senator Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, uh, I appreciate the uh, discussion that Senator Latz is bringing forward. What are the limits and what are the allowances for holding on to certain data? But if we would take it to a, a certain extreme position, then if we followed that, we could collect all sorts of information on, on a subject, uh, run off to a court and seek their uh, permission to hold it indefinitely. Uh, and I'm, I'm fearful uh, that we would just start collecting information on citizens for any suspicious activity. Uh, what would be the standard of holding it? How severe would it be? Um, is, it a, is it two tire tracks in an open field that shouldn't be there, or is it something a little bit more? Uh, can a judge determine whether or not that information should be held or not? And then what extent does it go? How far do we go with it? Uh, we established this standard along with the collaboration of law enforcement, um, thinking that seven days was appropriate for a criminal investigation and, or a potential, an imminent activity that may be actually happening. Uh, trying to anticipate a criminal activity based on an aerial picture uh, may or may not require further, further holding of that or retaining of that information. Um, I'm not sure if the suggestion that Senator Latz made is, is the best one. I think it is something that we could work on uh, in the event that there was some belief that there was some imminent criminal activity that was going to take place. But that's a standard that I haven't quite established in my mind yet. These are all good questions whenever we discuss data that's being held by a government uh, on the private actions of a citizen. How far do we go? And with technology, it opens a whole new field of we can retain it forever and we can collect as much as we want if we don't have proper parameters. More questions, members? Senator Latz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm not going to suggest an amendment right now because I'm, I'm not going to be able to do a draft anything on the fly. 
Um, and I'm as much of a Fourth Amendment advocate as anyone in this room. It's yep. what I do for a living, in fact, is try to enforce the Fourth Amendment. But um, I just it just seems to me seven days may, may be a little bit too short as law enforcement is considering the implications of however much data they gather. It might be a lot of data. It might take a long time even to go through and analyze it. Um, and it troubles me that it's possible, you know, an investigator that's working on stuff and you know, may remember information that was gathered two weeks ago and say, hey, wait a second, we just saw something with this new UAV data that was gathered that triggers a reference back to that, but oh, it's gone. And now it's harder to make that connection or at least objectively to make that connection. Um, so I, I'd be interested in having a conversation whether there should be some limited judicial bypass mechanism or some written standard which would allow an extension of seven days to 30 days or something like that. Um, uh, anyway, I think it's, it's worth considering here. I'm not going to hold the bill up over it, and I like the bill. I love the direction the whole thing is going. I think it's really important to do this. Um, I was on Senator Dibble's bill as a co-author in the past, and I'd, I'd like to, if there's still room, I'd like to be able to join this one as well. But I think that we might consider that provision uh, as the bill gets further consideration down the road. Senator Dibble, do you have anything you want to add? Um, Senator Limmer um, took the words out of my mouth, so I think he, uh, I, I, you know, I, I understand the, the need for equilibrium, um, but I'm cautious. I'm always cautious, especially with such an incredibly power, su powerful surveillance tool. Um, and uh, as Ms. Decker said, um, you know, we've had these conversations and Law enforcement has not been shy about articulating what they need and what they're comfortable with in this negotiation. And you know, but I, I, I'm happy to talk with Senator Latz some more. Um, but you know, this is similar to the ALPR conversation um, and some of the others that we've had recently. Senator Dietzik. Oh, I'm sorry, Senator Dietzik. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I, I hate to do this. I do have an amendment um, that. It is not my amendment. It came from one of my colleagues. Um, I don't know if they discussed it with either of you. Um, I am not, I do have a, it's the A5, so if we want to pass it out. Um, and, and I do have a question for clarifying after listening to some of this discussion. So what this does is, um, there's like two different parts. And the, the second part, which is on page four, I'll describe it as you're handing it out. Um, so that is the written policies required. So it adds in there, um, prior to the operation of the UAV, the chief officer of the local law enforcement agency must establish and enforce a written policy. So I kind of like that. Um, and then the first part talks about, and I don't know if this is where, I don't know if this actually works because as I was listening to the discussion, I'm not sure that if the law enforcement agency loans it out to another government entity, if that government entity is actually held to this policy. But the first part um, requires that the law enforcement agency provide the proposed written policy to the government governing entity, but I don't know if the governing entity is actually held to that policy. So that would be a question I have for council on that um, lines one, three, and one, four. And then also, if we do pass this governing body, I believe should probably be governing entity, but not sure. Council. Mr. Chair and members, I believe the goal of the amendment was um, in, in practice to have the law enforcement agency um, appear before their governing body, meaning the, um, the county or city that um, you know, makes decisions about their budget and things like that, and um, have the proposed written policy submitted to that governing body and make that policy available for public comment at the hearing. Now, the government entity that we've discussed under Subdivision 9 is a much broader concept than that and includes um, any other government entity like, um, a, you know, a state, including a state agency 
or um, it's, it's a reference to the broad definition of government entity in Chapter 13. So anyone else could, as long as they're a public body, still request the use from the um, law enforcement agency, and it would be up to the law enforcement agency in terms of what they write in their policies and whether the government entity who, who is using this for their, using the UAV for their benefit, whether they want to subject them to very specific requirements. That discretion retain, is retained with the law enforcement agency and perhaps with their governing local government, you know, county commissioners or um, whatever body about what, what, what they think is acceptable. Response to the amendment? Senator um, Limmer. Mr. Chairman, I have a question. Um, I don't know if I heard this correctly or not. Um, Council, did you say that any governing body could use, under this example, the drone that might be owned by a political subdivision, such as a state agency could be given permission to use a local city's drone, used primarily for law enforcement, but now for a different purpose? Council. So just, uh, Mr. Chair and members, just taking a step back, um, not looking at this amendment, but looking at the current language in the bill, yes, any government entity may request from any, um, lo any local law enforcement agency permission to use their drones. Um, All right. Senator Loomer. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, when I first thought, thought of that, I, I was under the impression that we were only the uh, subdivision that would own the drone, but used primarily for law enforcement purposes. Any, any other agency within that political subdivision could use it, uh, but not uh, uh, a different governing body. I can see in emergency cir circumstances that it could be used, um, especially for searching for uh, an individual, a person who gets out of a senior housing uh, nursing home, let's say, that wanders off, uh, a child that could be. So that I think I'd, I'm, uh, I'm okay with. Uh, as for the amendment itself, uh, I would see this as a friendly amendment. I wonder, is there any uh, public testimony from anybody on the amendment? I saw a thumbs up. Okay, members, any other questions? Well, Senator Dietzik renews her uh, motion to move the A5 amendment any more discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. So you got an extra vote there. Uh, Senator Limmer. Uh, Mr. Chair, I don't, uh, or is there any other further discussion or questions? Uh, Members? If not, I'll move Senate File 3073 as amended, be recommended. Oh, I correct myself, Senator, well, my. Senator Limmer. Our researcher corrected me, uh, Senate File 3074, as amended, be recommended to pass and move to the floor. Senator Limmer moves Senate File 3074 as amended, which will then go to the floor. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Senator Limmer, you're on your way with that. Thank bill. you. Uh, next up, Senator Limmer, you have the Senate file 3073. Senator Limmer, as soon as you're ready, you can explain the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senate file 3073 addresses the continued use of a legislative commission on data practices and personal data privacy. Uh, members might recall that over recent years, we employed the use of a commission to study 
uh, issues related primarily to data practices and the changing environment that technology is now creating. Uh, oftentimes in a, in a short legislative session, we simply do not have the time in this committee to unravel all the complexities of some of the issues regarding data privacy, how its effect is on, on citizens, and also the other balancing point of the public good that that technology can often bring. Uh, we formed this commission about, I think it's um, six years ago. Uh, the first four years was established as a commission. The last two was a subcommittee of the LCC. Um, this is a request to uh, put back into practice for another, until the year 2026, the uh, purpose of a legislative commission on data practices and personal data privacy. I think it's vitally important to keep up with this, these emerging issues uh, technology, uh, corporate use, as well as government use is, is leaping forward in quantum strides, and uh, legislative bodies all over the country are having a hard time keeping up with it. But this is one example of how a commission that meets during an interim can keep up with the emerging issues and consider and polish up uh, legislation that could be considered by the appropriate committee. Uh, in the near future in the next legislative session. It saves time for the legislative session as well as developing a degree of expertise by a bipartisan group of legislators trying to solve this issue in a bipartisan fashion. I'll stand for any questions. Thank you, Senator Limmer. Uh, is there anyone from the audience that would like to speak to the bill? Members have any questions? Wow. <laughs> Senator Limmer, you want to move your bill? I'll move quickly, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I move that Senate File 3073 be recommended to pass, and I believe move to the Finance Committee. State government. Oh, state government. Senator Limmer moves uh, Senate File 3073 uh, to the state government. Uh, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. The bill is passed. Uh, seeing no other work before us, uh, this committee is adjourned.